Do you remember that American classic, Rocky? Rocky Balboa, that amateur boxer who was selected to compete with the heavyweight champion of the world, Apollo Creed. And if you remember the intense battle scene where it's the penultimate round, round 14 of 15, and there's Rocky, and he's beaten up, bruised, bloodied. His eyes are swollen shut because he's been hit in the face so many times. His ribs are broken. I mean, he is just devastated, especially when Apollo Creed gives him an upper right-handed hook to the chin, sets him down, and poor old Rocky, bleeding, knocked down to the ground. Apollo Creed turns around, lifts up his hands in victory over his opponent, begins to boast. The referee begins to count. One, two, three. But Rocky had the eye of the tiger. He was the Italian stallion. Not to be defeated, not to be knocked down and knocked out, he staggers to his feet and tells the referee, I'm okay. I'm back up, on my feet, ready to go. Rocky gets knocked down, he gets back up, and then he goes the distance. It is a most unlikely comeback after a devastating blow that put him on the ground. But can such a comeback happen in the Christian life? After a devastating blow from sin and disbelief. When sin puts you down and puts you down hard, can you get back up again and go the distance with Jesus Christ? Can a Christian recover from a fall into deep and dark sin? It is the question that hangs over the heads of these 11 disciples. You remember the closing statement in John chapter 16? Jesus Christ prophesies that these 11 men will have a great fall. In the garden of Gethsemane, they will reject Jesus Christ, disown him, renounce their own discipleship, and fall, scatter, leave. They will go back to their pre-discipleship life, leaving Jesus alone. They will fall. But in his kindness, Jesus says, you'll get back up again, and you'll go the distance with me. How? How does it happen? How do these men get back up after such a devastating fall? It's what you need to learn because the Christian life, beloved, is filled with falls, falls into sin. The failure of the disciples teach you to not be naive about your own failure and your own sin as a disciple. The apostle James described the Christian life by saying, we all stumble in many ways. Do you believe that? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. And if you don't, James says, here's how you know. Just examine your words. Take a stock on your words. We curse people made in the image of God. Fathers, you blast your wife or children with your anger. You use little white lies to cover your failures and sins. The proof that the Christian life is a series of one stumble after another is located in between your teeth. What is more, the New Testament speaks of true Christians who wander from the truth, James 5.19 are caught in sin, Galatians 6, 1, and even who are captured by the devil, 2 Timothy 2, 26. What is more, we also see falls into serious and dark sin among Christians. Uh, you'll recall that some of the men in Corinth are using prostitutes. Or what about the church at Ephesus? They had become so loveless so loveless that Jesus threatens to disband them as a church altogether. They fell from their first love. 
Falling into sin is a regular feature of the Christian life. And I'm not saying this to encourage you to go into sin. In fact, the Bible is very clear. If you give yourself headlong, fully embracing sin with no repentance at all, that is a sign that perhaps you have not been saved at all and come to a saving knowledge of Jesus because a true Christian will repent. But what I am saying is that you must not be naive to the fact that the Christian life is a life of stumbling along and falling as you go. And so, Christian, you need, you desperately need to know the remedy of how to get back, how to get back on your feet, how to get back up again, so that you can finish the race and go the distance with Jesus. And in fact, that's what this prayer can do for you. When you fall, you can get back up, and so you should pay very close attention to what Jesus prays here. This prayer has been called the high priestly prayer. It reminds us that you are not saved directly by God the Father with a blast from heaven. You have a mediator, someone who comes and mediates God's sovereign salvation into your life, and his name is Jesus Christ. You remember, uh, this echoes the upper room discourse we've been studying, John chapter 14. Jesus said it like this, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Through me, I'm the mediator. If you want to get to the Father, you must come through my work in person. And here we see one of the aspects of his person and his work is the fact that he prays for the believer. He is your intercessor, your high priest. Hebrew says it this way, he ever lives to make intercession for us. And so, While this prayer is is historical, it also opens up the windows of heaven to see what your great intercessor is praying for you, Christian, right now. And if you're not a believer, this is an encouraging text. And the reason is this is an encouraging te- text is because you very well might be one of the people that Jesus Christ himself prays for. And if he prays for you, his prayer will certainly overcome your hardened heart towards him. And so as we study this glorious prayer, my hope, Christian, is that you will, even in your failure, you will go home singing Micah, I believe it's chapter 7 that says this, Rejoice not over me, O my enemy, when I fall, I shall rise. So let's sing that together as we consider this prayer. I want to ask this question. How can you, Christian, recover from a fall? We'll answer that question under two headings as we summarize this prayer in two parts. The first part, Jesus prays, glorify me. And in the second part, he prays, protect my people. So first, glorify me, the Father, to glorify the Son. That's what the request is. This is a prayer that is God-centered, redemptive, and successful. So notice how God-centered this prayer is. Look at verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. It is a prayer for the Father to take action and glorify the Son. Jesus restates it in verse 5 like this, glorify me, glorify me, exalt me, lift me, honor me, reveal me as beautiful and glorious. Glorify me. Now, in a world that seeks self-glory, I mean, just Scroll Instagram for a bit. What do you see? Self-glory, self-promotion, glorify me. Jesus is not praying some self-centered carnal prayer. Rather, the gospel writer has revealed repeatedly that the Father has sent the Son into the world with one mission, to glorify the Father. And he's revealed that the Father wants to glorify himself by means of glorifying the Son. And so when the son prays, glorify me, he's essentially saying, Father, 
execute your will. Father, your will be done. So Jesus here is God-centered, not self-centered in this request. But the question immediately arises, what is this exaltation? Jesus is telling the Father, act. Do something on earth. Do a work on earth that elevates me. What work, what act is Jesus requesting? Well, it is noteworthy here that his glorification is connected with his hour. The hour has come, glorify me. We've seen throughout John that the hour especially focuses on the death of Jesus. And the Father certainly glorifies the Son in his death, crowning him as Messiah. But while Jesus is clearly assuming his glory on the cross, it becomes clear that Jesus has another act of exaltation in mind, at least as the foreground in, the, in this request. Drop your eyes down to verse 4 and we get some clarity. Jesus says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. This then is a request for the ascension. The exaltation of the Son to the right hand of God in heaven. And notice this is the very place Jesus came from as the eternal Son of God. In other words, I was glorified as the Son in a way that was not veiled in my mortal flesh on earth. But when I am ascended into heaven, Father, you're going to take that veil off and you're going to show and display me as the eternal, uncreated, fully divine Son of God. And so this request looks at Jesus' dead body in a cold tomb and says, get me up. Bring me up, lift me up, and do it for your own glory. But notice here, this prayer for the glorification of Jesus to abound to the glory of the Father is also redemptive. It's a redemptive prayer. That is to say, this glorification of God the Father is connected with eternal life in the soul of God's people, a redeemed people. So notice how he connects the glorification of the Father with the giving of eternal life. Look at it again. The hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given to him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Notice, Jesus has authority over all flesh, all human beings without exception. But I thought Jesus was a tribal deity. I thought he was only Lord of the Christians. No, right here, Jesus Christ is referring to his divine sovereignty over all human beings ever created without exception. That is to say, Jesus has divine power to command and control the lives of every single individual. Then notice why God the Father gave this universal authority to His Son. To provide a universal salvation? No. No. Look at it carefully, verse 2, notice, you have given him authority over all flesh, that is over all human beings, to give eternal life to all whom you have given to me. In John, this group of people are the elect. The group of people that the Father decided to bind himself in a saving commitment from eternity past. Authority over all people. Authority over all the elect to save them. So this word all, listen, it transports us to the time before there was even time. Eternity past. In eternity past, the Father gave the Son universal sovereignty and a particular people and a command. Enter the world. 
save my people, get back up into heaven, and exercise your universal sovereignty to save my elect. It implies that salvation of the elect cannot happen until Jesus is glorified, until Jesus is shown to be magnificent in splendor and fully divine in nature, the eternal Son of God who came to redeem us. And when eternal life affects the soul of the believer, it abounds to the praise of the glory of God. That's how this works. When you receive eternal life, the effect on your soul is not, I am awesome. It's God's awesome. God is gracious. And you give glory to God the Father. This prayer is redemptive. Jesus must be exalted for you to be saved so that you will give glory to God the Father. Which leads to this third quality of this prayer. This prayer is also successful. It is successful. So this is a prayer. Glorify me. Get me up. I'll be dead in the tomb. Raise me from the dead and ascend me to your right hand. Acts chapter 1, Jesus has risen from the dead. And there he is teaching his disciples for 40 days about the kingdom of God. And then we read this. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight, that is, into heaven, to sit down at the right hand of God so right here, hours before his death, Jesus prays, glorify me. Glorify me so I can redeem your elect in all ages, who by their experience of eternal life will in turn glorify you. And 40 days after the resurrection, the Father answered. And from that day on, God's elect has been receiving eternal life and giving him glory for 2,000 years and counting from heaven in the souls of God's people and the heart of the elect. And Jesus asked for it. But I thought that the doctrine of sovereign election rendered prayer meaningless. No, it renders prayer successful. And your experienced church is the proof, is the proof that Jesus' prayer for his elect did not fail. Christian, today, you are experiencing eternal life now, which Jesus describes as fellowship, personal fellowship with God the Father and God the Son. It's why you know his fatherly love. It's why you know his comfort in grief. It's why you know his wisdom when you are confused. It's why you know power when you're weak. It's why you know his encouragement and hope when you are sad. You know the living God, don't you, Christian? That is eternal life, experiencing God the Father and God the Son in a living relationship. Why? Because Jesus prayed for his elect, and 40 days after his resurrection, the Father answered, Jesus prayed, the Father answered, glorify me. It's a prayer for the ascension. Get me up, bring me up, lift me up. Glorify me so I can give eternal life to all your elect, to the praise of your glory. This is history, beloved. This is what is happening across the world today and for all mankind. What is God doing? He's gaining glory through saving a particular people through Jesus Christ from heaven. But now, this is a practical prayer, isn't it? Jesus has been spending time with his disciples, th three years to be exact, and he's about to depart them, leave them without his physical presence on earth. And Jesus has taught them that uh, the world is not going to be a hospitable place for their faith. He knows the world will hate them, so now Jesus turns to intercede for 
these disciples, especially during the time of his physical absence. So prayer number two goes like this, protect my people. Father, protect my people. But it begs the question, who are Jesus' people? The people that the Father knows and the people that Jesus wants to intercede for. Well, the context of chapter 17 makes it very clear that Jesus has in mind the disciples. The 12 men who followed him in his earthly ministry, minus Judas, the one destined to betray him. And so, before Jesus prays for the 11, he identifies them And he identifies them, get this, as elect believers. Listen to the the language in verse 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So notice Jesus is expounding upon this doctrine of divine election he just referred to in verse 2. Notice that these men do and have come to Jesus in time. They kept God's word. It probably refers back to chapter 1 when Jesus calls them, follow me. Follow me. And the disciples obey, and they confess Jesus to be Messiah. They've kept the word of God. But notice that coming to Jesus comes after a divine transaction between the Father and the Son. Look at it carefully. I manifested your name to, who are these people? People you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they kept your word. First, they were yours. Then you gave them to me, and then in time, they kept your word. So, both the Father and the Son possess these men in a commitment to save them even before they came to believe and follow Jesus. In fact, it explains why Jesus, listen carefully, is praying for them and not for everybody. Drop your eyes down to verse 9. Look at verse 9. I am praying for them. Look at it carefully. I am not praying for the world. but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So why am I praying for these 11 men? Because they're not the world. They're not the group of people in rebellion against God. I'm praying for them because you possess them. They are yours. They belong to you. You might say this way, they are precious to you. And the world is not, not as such, not in its act of rebellion against God. What an amazing thing. Jesus is speaking of the world, not in terms, listen, of people who will be called out of the world into saving fellowship with Jesus. He is speaking in terms of the, of the world as people who never will, people who will remain perpetually in their act of rebellion against God and who are not owned in a precious possession by the Father from eternity past. Jesus prays for his own because the Father possesses them, and he does not pray for the world. And you're going to say to me, preacher, don't you know the most famous verse in the Bible? (laughs) Don't you? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. God loved the world. What do you mean God loved? God loves all people without exception. Yes, but he does not love all people in the very same way. Jesus here is talking about a unique love, a special love, a precious love. A love that he's had from eternity past for his own, a treasured possession And I'm going to talk to you fathers. I'm going to use a Father's Day illustration. Praise God. 
And this one's especially for you, Father, if you don't hold to sovereign election. And I'm hopeful that this will convince you to change your mind, okay? <laughs> Last summer, it's, I don't know, 110 degrees outside, like it is today. And I'm driving, getting close to my neighborhood, and I see a kid, I don't know, 8, 10 years old, he's riding his bicycle, and he's having some trouble. He's wa- well, he's walking now, he's kind of dragging his bicycle, and we're, bas- we're near the highway, so he's far from home, and I'm concerned for him. I'm like, this, he looks like he's struggling, so I pull over, and I start having a chat with the little lad. Hey, buddy, you doing okay? And he's like, I'm lost and I can't get home. And his face was red. He was sweating. I was concerned that he was, you know, going to have a heat stroke or something. So I said, you hang out here. I got some water. I gave him some water. Now, I don't know what that says about him, that he drank it. You're not really supposed to, you know, drink something from a stranger, but that's beside the point. Uh, (laughs) I was moved in compassion to help this little lad. I loved him, you might say. And thankfully, uh, other uh, folks came by and we got him home. In a sense, I love that little boy. But fathers, you know what I mean when I say, my love for my two children is radically different. It's deeper. It's longer. I gave that boy some water. I would die for my children. Yes, God loves the world. But he dies for his children. Say it that way. This is a, an electing love. A precious love. God chose to love these precious people from the foundation of the world. They are his precious possession. And he gives this precious people to his son and says, die for them. Bring them to me so I can live with them for all eternity before they existed. And so Jesus prays for them. But I thought the doctrine of election rendered prayer meaningless. No. It renders prayer successful. In fact, it renders prayer sweet to know that if you're a believer, Christ is praying for you. So these 11 disciples have been elect, and this election manifests itself like it always does in a saving attachment to Jesus Christ by faith. And so notice Jesus now expounds the fact that they have come to believe in him. Notice verse 6, listen to the language of attachment and faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, you gave them to me, and they have kept, their, kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So you hear the emphasis of Jesus. Jesus came to reveal and manifest the glory of God to these men, and these 11 obeyed the word, they know the word, they received the word as true, and they believed the word. Now, it is very clear in John that these men do not fully understand everything that Jesus Christ is or will do in the cross. I mean, they don't yet believe that he must rise from the dead. They get that later in chapter 20. But it is clear that Jesus does commend them for having the foundation, you might say the heart, of faith settled in their souls. I mean, look at verse 7 again. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. Or verse 8, they have come to know in truth that I came from you. It means these men have a settled conviction that Jesus is God's representative. That is to say that Jesus reveals God accurately and fully I'm not really sure what Jesus means by this I am the vine bit or I'm the bread from heaven bit or that we got to eat his flesh and drink his blood. I'm not so sure about what that means, but here's what I do know. I know that this man here is God's revelation. This man right here has God's fully divine word. 
So you see what this is. This is a sincere conviction that Jesus reveals God and his truth perfectly. And this full conviction issues in a total submission to the divine authority of Jesus. These men believe in their souls. What Jesus teaches must be divine truth from God because Jesus said it. Because Jesus said it. I believe it because Jesus said it. It's the core of faith, isn't it? Even if you don't understand everything, I believe it because Jesus said it. Uh, Theologians call this faith seeking understanding. Faith seeking understanding. That is to say, our approach to God's revelation is not like this. Jesus, if you do a miracle, and then you scientifically explain to me how you achieved that miracle, you answer all my questions about the historicity of Jesus and the Bible and the Gospels, you resolve all my theological tensions, then I'll believe in you. No, 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 no. That's, in an ultimate sense, understanding seeking faith. We teach faith seeking understanding. He's the revelation of God. Whatever Jesus says must be true because it's from God. Jesus is God's representative. So, though I don't fully understand everything he says, I believe what he says. And Lord willing, in time, I will come to understand it fully. And so, beloved, this has such practical help for you as a disciple of Jesus. The vision of a disciple of Jesus is faith seeking Understanding this side of the cross and resurrection, we have a firm faith in the gospel. We believe in Jesus as the Son of God, crucified, risen. We have eternal life because of his gracious work alone. We're justified by faith alone. So we we have a, I believe it because it's the gospel revelation from Jesus. I believe what Jesus says no matter what. But you got to admit, there's a lot in this book that you don't quite understand, do you? And faith is, Seeking understanding means that you should change your mind. Like when you see something in the Bible that conflicts with your present view of God or Jesus, you you, get this, this is freeing for you. You can change your mind. Oh my. And let me give you an example of that, okay? Quick survey, how many of you here were here last week? Just a simple raise of hands. Okay. Half of you guys. So half of you guys will understand where I'm coming from here. Last week, uh, we studied the failure of the disciples to believe in chapter 16, verse 31. Do you now believe? Implication, no, because you're going to fail. So Jesus is saying, you don't believe now. And I took that to mean, and I told you that meant, these men had no faith at all. (laughs) And as I began to query John 17, I read statements like this. You have come to know and to believe I came from God. Hmm. Did I get that wrong? (laughs) And uh, so as I study John 17, I'm like, I think I got that wrong (laughs) in front of everybody. Shame. But I didn't get Jesus wrong, (laughs) nor his divine sovereignty or authority. And so I've changed my mind before your very eyes. Wow. Wow. Jesus is teaching in that verse, though these men stumble, they do have the core of faith. So their issue is the the issue of an immature faith, not no faith. They have a faith that needs to grow up. I got it wrong, but I got it wrong with faith seeking understanding, which frees me to change my mind. Uh, Beloved, this is normal discipleship. It's okay for you to admit I was wrong. I was wrong about that. But I I believe whatever Jesus says goes. And so I want to appeal to you, especially in this teaching right here. And I understand, I understand deeply, deeply, that the doctrine of sovereign election is tough to get on on board with. Okay, so I, I I rejected this view for a long time. And so I probably have more objections to it than than you do in my past. I could out argue you on your objections. Uh, But in God's kindness, I've come to embrace them. I've changed my mind. And I want to encourage you to change your mind. (laughs) Just change your mind. You can change your mind because Jesus has taught it. 
And so let's embrace the compatibility of God's election and prayer, God's election and evangelism. Uh, Jesus teaches it, so we should embrace it because our faith is a faith-seeking understanding. It must be divine truth because God said it, even if I can't understand all of it. We want to call you to this mature discipleship. So that's what Jesus does. He, he identifies who the men are that he prays for. And now Jesus utters a precious prayer as he prays for their eternal life to be preserved. Protect my people. Who are my people? These are like believers. And now I pray for your protection of them. Notice verse 10. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you in the ascension. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction. So notice this is a prayer of protection. Protect them, guard them, keep them safe. Only clearly Jesus is not asking them for physical protection. Chapter 16, he actually prophesies that some of these men will be martyred for the faith. This here must be a prayer for spiritual protection. Well, what does it mean? What is this prayer for spiritual protection? Well, it becomes clear when you notice the purpose of this prayer is given in terms of unity. He says, Father, keep them in, their, in your name that they might be one. And so the son says, I came to manifest your name, your character to your people. They have believed it, received it. Now keep them in your name. That is to say, keep them believing in me, the one who exposes them and reveals your character. And when all these men preserve or persevere in faith in Jesus, together they are united in their confession and obedience to Jesus Christ. Uh, the spiritual safety is also explained by a contrast with Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition. Uh, notice Jesus says, I protected all of them, with one exception, Judas Iscariot. Why? Well, because he's not in this group of people who believed. He's not part of these elect believers, and therefore he had no faith to protect. But the, the scriptures must be fulfilled. He must go to destruction. He must betray me. And so Jesus is praying for the protection unto eternal life that these believers would persevere in their faith in Jesus to the end so that they can see him face to face in heaven. It is a prayer that God the Father would nurture and nourish and empower their faith to the end so that all of them will not be lost, but arrive in the kingdom and see the glory of the one true God. And in fact, Peter applies this prayer to the entire church in his first epistle. He says this way, by God's power, the Christian You've fallen. You've sinned. You've stumbled. By God's power, you are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. If you are His elect believer, He is praying for you that your faith will not ultimately fail, but be strengthened to the end. Jesus purchased for you saving faith. And though your faith will stumble and fall along in this Christian life, Jesus prays, let it not fail to destruction. Let it not fail to perdition, to judgment. And so you can say, rejoice not over me, O my enemy, though I fall. I shall rise because Christ prayed for me. And so it implies, Christian, your faith should not go toward fear but toward joy. You are on the track to entering the glorious kingdom of God with Jesus Christ. You follow him not only carrying a cross on earth, you follow him to the crown in heaven. 
And because Jesus Christ has prayed for you, he will get you there. So notice verse 13, this triumphant prayer here. But now I am coming to you, and these things, probably referring to the upper room discourse, these things, these things we believe to the end, I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus comes to fulfill. He comes to fulfill. The old covenant pointed forward to a new era, a new covenant, a new king, a new temple, a new priesthood, a new law. And here Jesus says a new joy. Now, the saints had a lot of joy. You go open the Psalms, the saints were filled with joy. They sang the Psalms. And I hate to say it, uh, they outsang some of you. <laughs> I've seen some of you sing, and, and some of these Psalms outsang you. <laughs> and so you need to learn, we all need to learn to lift our voices in joy. But, but why, did the, why did the Old Testament saints sing? Because of God's saving acts. And how it revealed his steadfast love for them. Here's a song. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. Look at the saving works of God for us. It reveals he loves us. And he saved us. And so we have happiness in our souls and rejoice in God. That's the pattern here. And Jesus Christ is the work of God. He's the will of God, the work of God for your salvation. And this joy that is anticipated in the Old Testament finds its ultimacy in Jesus Christ, who died and rose again to inaugurate this wedding banquet of the kingdom of God to give you the new wine of the Holy Spirit, so that by the Spirit in your soul, you can rejoice with the very joy of Jesus Christ, the king who is rejoicing in the resurrection and who is sitting down in glory right now, he shares his own joy with every single believer. Therefore, since we have been justified with faith, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's your faith. The glory of God is coming, and you're going there. Jesus was judged for you. He was raised for your justification, and he gave you the new wine of the kingdom for you to enjoy now, the present fellowship of God and of Jesus Christ. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, church. He has done glorious things. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to you, his elect believer. And how do you know this prayer will be answered? Jesus prays, glorify me. Forty days after he was raised, the Father answered. And he entered into heaven. And he sat down. And the result is you have eternal life. You have eternal protection. And you can have eternal joy. How can you recover from a fall? You have fallen, but Jesus has prayed. You have fallen, but Jesus has prayed. You have cheated, but Jesus has prayed. You have lied, but Jesus has prayed. You have quit, but Jesus has prayed. You have sinned. But Jesus has prayed. How can you recover from a fall? Though you keep failing, Jesus keeps praying. He is your perfect mediator. He ever lives to intercede for you. And the Father has answered. The image that comes to mind for me, in another Father's Day illustration for you, as we close, you have a, toddler on the playground and he's trying to climb the ladder and there his father is supporting him behind making sure he doesn't you know fall off and break his neck and the little tyke he slips on a on one of the ladder steps 
about five feet high. He slips. He's about to fall. But the father catches him, keeps him up. The prayer of Jesus, this prayer of Jesus, is the father's hand that lifts up his son when he stumbles. You have fallen, but Jesus has prayed. So church, listen to and believe that the Father always answers the Son's prayer for you. So you can go out singing every time, rejoice over me, not my enemy, though I fall, I shall rise. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these precious promises. Though I fall, I shall rise. Because your salvation from start to finish is in your own hand. Our salvation's in your own hand. And Jesus Christ has prayed for us. Father, I pray for your saints, especially for your saints who feel guilty of their sins. I ask that they would hear your prayer and be encouraged that, Jesus, you ever leave, live to intercede for them. So strengthen our faith, help us to share in the wine of the kingdom, the great joy that we have in Christ. And answer the prayer ultimately, Father, to bring us home, to bring us into your presence. In Christ's precious name, amen.